is what actually pans the sound. Uh, but other than that, it's pretty much normal super collider code. I mean, basically the idea is just you change synth to cluster synth and so forth, and it should work. Um, so the problem uh, that I needed to, to deal with to make this work is that to make a synth play in two computers at the same time, so it has to start exactly at the same sample, and not only that, it has to have exactly the same output. So if your synth has some kind of random number generated involved, like a white noise has, it has to have exactly the same random seed, otherwise you'll have two different white noises going on in each computer, will completely destroy the spatialization. So there are some little things that you have to watch out, um, yeah, basically the, the issue of the random seed has to be the same in any random thing you use. And also, every time you, you allocate a buzz, you have to allocate two, or every time you allocate a buffer, it has to be two, because it's two computers, or if it was four computers, it would be four. And since this is kind of boring, I wanted to simplify the process. And to do that, I created a cluster library, which basically fools super collider into thinking that two servers are just one server. And what this syntax of cluster buzz does, or synth, is that it creates in the background two synths, two buzzes, etc. Um, but the syntax is the same as creating just one. So you don't have to keep track of all these pairs of things that you're, you're creating. So yeah, all these uh, super classic classes have to be changed into their cluster version. And at the time, uh, had a customized version of the panning scenes, uh, based, I mean, just copy paste from their current software enough to start them. Um, so, and basically the way it works is you create your synth. Your synth must have a mono output going to a certain buzz. And then after that, in the tree, uh, you put the panner, which is receiving input on the same buzz. And that will output 192, well, 96 channels on each computer. So the only thing you need to make sure is the panner is after your synths or after all the chain of things you want to have. Um, and then through the language, when you create an object, you just do dot move x, y, and it will move, basically. So if you connect a slider to this, you move, it will, it will just work. Um, yeah, and I mean, it was working at the time. I mean, I haven't used it since, and my idea would be that now that we are starting to work on the second version, once the, sync, the new syncing system is made, um, to kind of port this library to that system shouldn't be too difficult. And then you don't even need to change anything when you're there. I mean, just when you put the MacBook uh, with the current software that's there, you should be able to use it this way also. Uh, yeah, and I think that kind of concludes what I wanted to say. So maybe if you have some questions, I can try to answer. I'm pretty curious about the, the GUI yeah. that you're going to be using for the, for the Yeah. Is there anything like already? I mean, there are some plans, but I mean, it's not at that phase yet. We're still, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, we'll certainly use parts of the old GUI. It's hard enough to do already, so. But we'll have to have an. Uh, to deal with these plugins, to deal with how you connect uh, things one to another, and yeah, we still have, uh, I think, some design issues to uh, decide like how to to do it. So yeah, I don't have anything to show you at the moment. Yeah, and, and it's you that's working on it, or is it also uh, Alter? Alter also, I mean. We haven't decided. I mean, now we're just working on the building blocks. But then when we get there, we'll see how to distribute it. But if you want everything is on GitHub, everything is on GitHub. So if you know something about it, you can always 
Uh, yeah, sure. If you want to contribute, uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. If you find bugs and you correct them and you send a patch, that's great. <laughs> Yeah, more people uh, would be willing to check things out. And also, I mean, it, it is an open source system, so yeah. you are free, at least at home, to do anything with it you want. But maybe if there are sensible contributions or interesting ideas, you can treat them well. Yeah, so, I mean, so you can find it on website. Yeah, the code is here on this one. Yeah. yeah. This is the code, so you, yeah, you go yeah, there. You can find that link on the Game of Life website as yeah. well, I think, so everyone <coughs> should be able to find that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's only on the, on the first version. Okay. So, um, that's good to know. Where is the development app right now? This is the, 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 the system that I introduced with the timestamps. That uh, last thing I did on it was to get that thing uh, working. It was playing scores in my computer, it seemed to be playing them right, and I haven't tested it in the system yet. That's the next thing I will do, go there with Walter, mm -hmm. test if that works, and if it goes as well as it went in my computer, it's working, basically. So then it will, we will start on like how to build the chains of um, the synthesis, uh, so you can put effect and this kind of thing, how to package it and how to, uh, what's the interface to the user. So, yeah, that's the state that it is. So, so, so the, you, are, you are planning to provide the whole sort of synthesis engine with the real time? Yeah, I mean, the idea is you can put any super clever code. I mean, we still have to see exactly what are the restrictions we have to do because I mean I don't think you can make a graphical version of Super Collider because I mean if someone knew how to do that uh, that would have been done already but so you have to put some kind of philosophy or you know like yeah. is it mixer strips or you know some other metaphor of what's going on because otherwise it's just Super Collider code and then but it should be very free in whatever framework it appears to to just put your own uh, synths and uh, effects. And yeah, I mean, there are many things uh, you, you can be thinking of, but I have been thinking of lately what I have been discussed with uh, Miguel and, and, and Walter is that for instance, I mean, if, if you want to, well, maybe I turn around, and if you uh, want to use, for instance, stochastic uh, systems, maybe you want to have a kind of, like, well, imagine like you, you want to build a kind of landscape and uh, you have some frogs or corn over there and you have some birds doing something different over there, like flock behavior or anything. It could be really interesting if you could build some code in the software where you can say, well, I have these sound files and these sound files are false. So I have an internal code with the letter F. <laughs> and I also have some sound files and those files are going to behave like the birds. So you get the code B. And then it would be possible to write your own uh, plugins, I call it for now. And those plugins act on a known folder, and they know all kinds of sound files are in there. And they can take files from the folder and put behaviors on that kind of thing. I mean, that is one one way of thinking. What, yeah, at least the way I would like to think about how things would be possible. So that also has to do with uh, yeah, thinking about uh, the architecture because yeah, exactly. it becomes even more important if you want to use the system as a real-time system because if I want to do the birds real-time of course I don't want to move every bird because I only have two ends so you want to use some kind of flock behavior but I mean the real-time controller should know who is the flock 
and who is the fox? And so those are like yeah, design yeah, sure. issues to, to think about. But I mean, I think at some point when you want to get to like slightly more sophisticated behavior, I think you need to start writing some super collider code, which can be like made like really simple. So you just need to enter like what's really, you don't need to set up almost anything. It's like you just say, it's like a simplified version maybe of it with everything else set up. But, but I think, yeah, it, because then you really have the power to connect wherever you want to wherever you want. You know? And I mean, for instance, yeah. even even if you just expose like that all the parameters of the synths and all the all the parameters of space, and if you could address those parameters from outside, either from SuperCollider code or via OSC, you can in your own way come up with whatever way you want to connect those things. You know? yeah. So in some other patch, you connect the, some you know, modulation index with where the thing is on the room, or how fast it's going, or if it's close to the other thing. Then, I mean, the limit is your imagination, really. Uh, actually, that's what one of the techno guys uh, asked because he wanted a sound to move like that. He wanted to move it with an elephant with a sink to the beat. Yeah, well, we yeah. do not have that. But yeah. I mean, such a system should make it easy for, oh, you want to have the other, well, that's not too difficult, and then that line of code should yeah. be able to write it in 10 seconds. Yeah. So, that's the idea. And I think for, for those things to be able to really work, and I should think about how do you, how do you make your interface. In. Yeah. And I think it's, it's maybe a bit comparable to the, you know, for people who know the Janoma project for Max MSP where they have like a kind of superstructure of how am I going to make my patches, I'm always going to send the messages in the left. I mean, that is like a design uh, yeah. ideas where some things are always the same. So you do not have to learn too much to start uh, interconnecting things. Yeah. yeah, I think that, that should be the goal. I mean, also, you were talking about these reverb uh, systems. I think it would be very nice to have a, a, a good reverb implemented that you can just like reverb, drag, you know, and just deal with the physical parameters of the Well, this is one of the things I'm really thinking about now. How to yeah. do that. Um, so, looking a bit into different kinds of reverb formulations. How can you keep it easy? And how yeah. can you? all the sources and have the different distance effects and I mean that would be something that really looks like a plug in. I mean crossfade and yeah, I think I people will be amazed how <laughs> how actually not so bad that sounds even yeah. if it's completely uh, you know not scientifically yeah, of course and, but, uh, but I think because it's not scientific you also need to be able to draw a kind of curve maybe you want it a bit flatter or Steeper. I mean, so yeah. you can play with the curve and you're, you're ready to go. Yeah. So that's also. And I think also I to bring uh, controllers to the system at some point, if you want, like either through some layer of your own program that, uh, of course, deals with what you want your controllers to do, but also so to have m like a real live uh, thing happening at. Uh, me, I played with an iPhone, with, a, with a, which actually for testing is quite nice because I can walk around the room and change levels and yeah. things. So. so, so you're thinking that within this year? Yeah, I I, I, I think. T I mean, things uh, have a tendency to get uh, delayed, but uh, I mean that's the objective is to be this year. If you imagine playing with the system, what is the things you you like you think you would want to have there that you think you would be interesting for you? Well, the reason why 
you guys are here, actually, is also for the conversation that happened with Phyllis, too, is, is for us to think, and the, the real time thing is what really connects you guys and what we do at this time. So the possibility of performing in the live. And that's why also we wanted to host a workshop at the end of this year, and hopefully there'll be a real time version to also introduce it to our community, which are all people dealing with performance. So not just musicians, but also theater people and um, you know, other kinds of performing arts. And for us, most of the people who come through here, the way we make music is always mostly on the fly. Or they build a system that allows them to explore within real time, and then that becomes a composition of space. So the idea of doing something you know, pre-composing it and bringing it to a system is, is too much of a distance. So just the possibility of going to a space and having you know, a joystick or uh, some kind of gestural controller or even walking around the room and then um, sort of exploring the space and that becomes a composition of space, I think it's already a, a drastic difference in what it is now. Yeah, I think once the system opens up the interface, then I'm sure all kinds of things we didn't think of yeah. you know, can be done by people that... And, and, and also one of the experiences I have when I listen to your system is that because there's such concept settings that you sit, you're putting yourself in a very sort of strict compositional space. And I find that interfere with the physical space, the physics that you're working as well. Because you're sitting there listening to the composers the structural and the, the space. So I feel like I'm always going against my psychoacoustic as well. But I hear the physics of it, but I'm also trying to listen to the compositional space of things, of how they're structuring things, and you know, things moving, but then I can do that as a physical phenomenon, or as a compositional sort of in relation to other things. And I think having a performer in a space doing this would drastically change experience of, of the system because then there's a focal point and then it makes it room to uh, I don't know. Anybody wants to do what we do? I think it would be uh, quite paradoxical thing at some point because you have probably sounds which are like can be, you know, so um, far away or near or so many and then to have one performer True. which is at one place will be a quite interesting uh, yeah. thing to to experience. Yeah, well, So 
I mean, there was a direct connection. And for myself, I am thinking or looking for a way how I can translate it. Because personally, I'm not interested in a kind of a camera motion tracker and doing this in space because it's not my language. I think. So well, that's interesting. Yeah, um, please, I think I, I've seen a lot of performers with, with controllers which want it to be very physical and a lot of them I see that they just place a mono speaker you know by the chair because they for instance when playing with other people they want it, like their sound to be just as if it was a physical instrument so sure. and uh, you know from that to the wave field synthesis there's a whole yeah, spectrum yeah. to run through and, but for sure, the two approaches will require quite different uh, um, solutions, and to um, which yeah, it's quite almost the opposite. Instead of you know, like the sound comes from here because I'm here and I'm playing t to something which the sound can come from anywhere, but it's still me yeah. that is playing here and now. So I'm really curious to see how that will be addressed. It's a good example because you see it with uh, some of the laptop orchestras where they are really working with individual speakers next to the laptop because as audience, I mean, we have like 10 people with laptops and who is doing what? I mean, what sense does it make if they do something live if, if I cannot connect the sound to the place? So that's, that's really a good example. And what about the, the power of the system or the, the the electronics, the barriers and the, the system can be reproduced on the other side, not physically. Sure. If you can take the system to another place? No. no we we produce. We produce, like make a copy, build a copy. Um, and, and with what characteristics have the, the system in power? Sources with uh, best interpolation, I think. Uh, and you, if you make with the assimilation with, uh, for example, 24. Yeah. It's uh, like more. in a line. So I think then you get to the point where you have a sweet spot. Because 24, you want to make a square. So you divide 24 by 4 which is six speakers on each side. You need a minimum distance from speakers to make it work. So I think you don't need to get it working with 24. So it will be only you the minimum of the system. So I would say you build an ambisonic system, you only need like eight speakers, which is a lot less. Which is 60 speakers less. And you can do the same, and it's just for you. 
those 84, it's, I mean, why, why 192? It's, it's also because we thought about, well, what is the number of people who want to be able to have in their installation? And, well, I always reckon with 0.75 square meters per person as a maximum, and then you have some minimum distance from the speaker. And then you can make a calculation that with uh, 192 speakers, it's something like 70 or 80 persons. I forgot the exact number, but it was something like when, well, when you have contemporary music concerts in the Netherlands, and you have 60 people, you have to do them. So, that's where we get to. We'll keep you up there. <laughs>
still kind of new but um, I'm getting more and more used to it mm. to, um, to how it feels to hold the, the controls and also mm, what gestures I can apply to generate how is the small screen working for you 
that is sort of a transition. Mm -hmm. Transition from a big screen to a, a small screen to no screen at some point. <laughs> um, so it's just, um, uh, I'm still learning the instrument though, but that's the reason why I still have a monitor. But the um, idea is to get completely rid of uh, any screen. But right now it gives me all the information I need to have. So it's, it's good to have some. Cool. Are you filming now? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's, I don't know. It, it has to do with the, with the energy supply. And if that's not sufficient, it brings the whole system uh, out of control. So I, s I presume yesterday was because the batteries weren't charged enough or something. But I'm not sure. This is How long is the batteries last? Two, three hours. But they were actually supposed to be freshly charged. So, so I charged another pair uh, tonight, throughout the night, and I uh, replaced them today. And it's working now. <laughs> And the, the design of, and the shape of it is pretty much set now. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Is it light there, enough for well, you? Well, there, there's, there's still two things to do. The, um, the positioning of the left, uh, the right hand little finger buttons. Hmm? It's hard. They, um, they need to be uh, positioned differently. They need to get a bit higher. Because the idea is to have one row like that, another row like that, and a third row like that. And that's how I go through the octave. So, it's like... This, but the left hand button is in on the same row as the second one and that should be more on that uh, that should be more on the first row and that one should be more on that row so as you can see there needs to be um, there need to be made a uh, compromise between the ergonomical positioning of the fingers on uh, the instrument and um, you know musical thinking it's basically um, right now it's hard to think in intervals because you get confused um, that's a bit of uh, the positioning of those and concerning the pressure sensor that is um, probably not the right place because then it's hard to for me right now to simultaneously press buttons and apply the pressure sensor. So, so that it is, is, is really difficult and awkward actually. And that doesn't change much if you if you practice a lot. So the, the pressure sensor sen sensor will go somewhere yeah. uh, somewhere around here for the thumb to play on. So you can. Um, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this grumpy guy hanging around with this long face. No, oh, that's really cool. And it seems to work really long. So this turn this on. Turn that on. But without without uh, voice right now, just sample playing.
that's uh, the possibility. So can you tell me uh, what, I can't remember when the last time you talked for us, but can you tell me what you've been working on or what Stan has been doing for you in the last uh, couple of times? <sighs> <laughs> A lot of things happened uh, in the meantime. Well, as far as I remember, we had like, for these two controllers, we had one, we had two um, receivers, um, which um, transmit the data from, uh, I get from the controllers uh, to the computer. Now I have one receiver for that purpose. Um, we had different um, uh, batteries on both controllers. Now we have like um, uh, really strong uh, batteries which hold uh, apparently very long. We made some little adjustments on the buttons uh, on, the, on, the, on the ergonomics of the instrument, like li really little things like, um, <clears throat> like, I don't know if you can see that. So th this row of buttons is higher than this one. So that's what um, uh, we changed. We uh, got another one, sort of a panic button down here. Um, we also um, experimented with, um, with um, the left finger buttons. So they were at the beginning, uh, according to the ergonomics of my hand and of my uh, fingers, they were down here. That, may, that makes uh, completely sense in, in terms of ergonomics, but in terms of uh, musical uh, logic or, yeah, musical logic, it didn't make sense because um, you get confused if this button is down here and it's in, on the same row as this uh, row. So now it's, it's, it's more, more or less a compromise between ergonomics and musical uh, approach. So there is this line, the second row, and the third row. And also these um, upper buttons are lifted a little bit, or in that case the, there's additional material um, attached to it. Then we change the position of the pressure sensor, which is, down, which is now played by the thumb, as you can see it here. Uh, it used to be here. Um, that is kind of cool to play with, 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 with uh, the, the index finger. But it is sort of um, difficult to play at the same time as you play um, the other buttons. Now I'm, I'm, I'm able to do that simultaneously. Yeah, what else? Um, tune actually, um, apart from um, um, uh, other little things in terms of uh, electronics, he, he um, um, attached this new battery, but also uh, we made this detachable, which is very convenient during um, uh, the live performance situation. Um, we, what did we, what else did we do? Yeah, Florian worked on, on, on the stand, to, or he's actually right now at the moment working on the stand, so, so that the, uh, the controllers sit um, nicely on the stand, so people can see what they are not used. And on this stand, there will be attached a, a little monitor for me to monitor things. So a couple of weeks ago, you had your first public performance with the shells. Yeah. Can you tell me how that went uh, and how what, what you found out through that? Well, that was part of my, my solo performance with uh, the Wii setup, and so three let's say three-fourths of the whole performance was the, the usual old setup, so to speak, and, and uh, a quarter of the length of the performance was, was with um, the shells. I call this instrument the shells. And um, it all went very smooth. So I could uh, grab the new instrument after playing the, the other one, and because we had uh, two computers for each instrument to 
deal with all that. And um, apart from that, Frank was uh, um, helping me. He was there too, and he took care of all the um, electronic and uh, computer part of the show. So I could completely focus on the artistic output, so to speak. And well, um, of course, the whole instrument, since it is brand new to me, still needs um, practice as, as any other instrument. But I, um, I can say that I had the control of it, that I, I, I wasn't lost um, in, in, in that respect. So it, I, I, feel sec I felt secure enough um, yeah, to, to have a, 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 a quite satisfying musical result in the end. And as far as I can tell, the audience uh, reaction was also very positive. It's also nice because um, the shells and the way they are programmed and set up um, is almost um, almost uh, the contrary of uh, the setup with the two week controller. So that implies it gives um, it gives you a complete different uh, visual aspect of the performance. So uh, gestures which I apply for the Wii setup. I would not apply or not, or I would um, definitely apply them in a complete different way. And so it, it's a complete different appearance of, uh, of the musician performer um, in terms of, of its uh, perception from the audience standpoint. Okay. Wait for it. How's the, the glasses? Are they, do, they do, do, do you see that they are actually dirty? No. You see yourself? Look, can you see? Yeah, but do you see that the glasses are dirty? No. Okay, good. Good. So, um, here we go. Should we start from the beginning? You say record, right? Or I'm, I'm recording now. So cool. Getting 
getting sunburned. Yeah, you felt, you looked comfortable for like, yeah. the first time I've seen you really comfortable with it somewhere. But I've been having seen you do it a lot. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hunter or what? Yeah. Ah, well. There's your letters. Where is he? Where is he looking? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and then it's reversal time or something, so you, you can sure. go sure. cold. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's visual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what we're doing right now is um, we're, uh, we have these nice uh, prototype instruments, shells, that uh, Jun made for Alex, and I'm making a new version of these things. And right now we're checking that, checking that all the, bu that, all the buttons and knobs and everything. Say that again? From... Um, the whole thing? No, from... Uh, and right now we're going to make a new version. Okay. okay. And uh, right now, um, I'm working on a new version of these things. But the positioning of the buttons has been worked out painstakingly in detail. So the new version will have exactly the same buttons in exactly the same places. And I am now figuring out the mapping of the buttons, which button operates which channel of the software, because the new version has to have exactly the same mapping as well. So we're just going through all the different buttons, and I'm just writing down which channel is which button. And then when I program the new devices, I make sure that that map stays the same. Which means that we are able to uh, keep on programming the software as we used to, instead of reprogramming the whole instrument again. So that's, that's basically the idea of switching from the prototype to the final version of the instrument, which we call the shells. Okay. Yeah. That's, uh, so we, we tested most of the buttons. Now we want to see the joystick channels yes. and the ultrasound. The joystick. That is X or Y that you're moving now. I'm moving it to the left and to the right. That would be X. X, yes. And I think it's analog pin 5, if yeah, I'm not looks mistaken. Like, it looks like it's 5. And then 6 would be uh, hoch und runter, uh, Epsilon. Yeah. Yeah. up and down. That's... Pin six, see? And the one that says channel four, when it says zero, zero, that must be the ultrasound then. The ultrasound is right here. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Ultrasound. Okay, then I've got everything. That's all. Yes. That's basically it. Now I know what I need to know. And actually, I guessed everything right. Did you? Yeah. Well, I measured. The right hand, I measured I mean, everything. I mean, the, the left hand, I had to guess. And I guess it's right. So it's the, the thing why these uh, buttons are not in logical terms, especially the, the, mm -hmm. the left finger. It was the left, this row was added later, I guess. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> I figured it out. <laughs> it's okay, it doesn't matter to me. That's, uh, you know, yeah. it's just in the end. Okay. How's it going? Okay, thank you very I'll much. I'll go back upstairs and uh, do more soldering. Yeah. That's it? That's yeah, it. That's, that's it. That's it. Yeah. But I guess you can... Uh, shoot some nice pictures of uh, stock soldering oh, yeah, sure. on yeah. boards and stuff. Yeah. I follow you. Here. For the left hand, right? Yes, one of the board this for this is gonna be this hand, like this. This is going to be inside it. So from inside. And you can see these white squares. That's where the buttons are going to be. I have to solder on these push buttons. And all the other electronics is on the other side of the board and it comes off. Ding. So here you have connectors and, and this, this little computer module. The little problem that occurs though is that the pins of these blue sockets where this thing plugs in stick through the board and they have to be soldered from the bottom. But the buttons that go on from this side, uh, this row of buttons has to sit completely flat on the board. So the pins that stick out a tiny bit here, I'm not sure if you can see that on the camera, they have to be flattened somehow. And I, uh, of course, tried cutting them with uh, sharp snippers, but it doesn't go flat enough. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to go downstairs to the milling machine and use the milling machine to, to, milling cu machine. to cut away a uh, freezer machine. Oh, really? To cut away the pins that are sticking out too far. Ooh, very oh. carefully. And then uh, I can solder the buttons on from the other side. That's so that's going to be the, my next adventure for today. <clears throat> that sounds tricky.
Yeah, I did it last week. It works fine. I had to repair the milling machine first, but now the milling machine is operational again. And uh, the, the milling machine is basically much like a drill machine. It has this rotating head. And uh, the main difference is that it has a plateau, which can be moved very carefully, very precise, in two directions. In this way, it moves sideways with this crank. Drill for drilling holes, but it's uh, it's a kind of drill that's it's a mill. It can cut into material sideways, or it can cut into material, which is good. And I have to decide which bits I'm going to mill. Mill until it's just pressing on the piece of paper. That's too much. Guess. Yeah, the, the pins that are lying inside these white squares, where the buttons are going to be, are uh, gone. Now, they're at least they're not sticking out. Here you can feel it. To a very exact height, and it won't cut any it deeper. Won't cut if, deeper. You, if I would just use normal sandpaper, I would damage the, the circuit board around the pins. Yeah. And with this machine, it just cuts only the pins and leaves the rest untouched.